Hi, thank you for watching Digging for Truth today. My name is Henry Smith of the Associates for Biblical Research, and I'm your host. Digging for Truth explores the truth claims and the world of the Bible. On our show, we defend the trustworthiness and truthfulness of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. On today's episode, ABR staff member, Pastor Brian Wendell, joins us from Canada to talk about events surrounding the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. In particular, he's here to talk about evidence for the census in Luke chapter 2, and the man who was governing Syria at that time, Quirinius. Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Thanks so much for having me back, Henry. It's great to join you again. It is. It's always fantastic having you on the show. Now, we should mention before we get started that we have another episode that you and I did together about Caesar Augustus from Luke 2, and Quirinius, who was governing Syria, is also mentioned in Luke 2. And these are sister episodes, so we want to encourage people uh, to go to YouTube or to record uh, this previous episode and watch them in conjunction with one another. So along those lines, we're in Luke 2, we're in the birth narrative of Jesus, and we're talking about this guy, Quirinius. Uh, Brian, tell us about this gentleman who uh, was governing in Syria at the time. Sure. Well, his name was Publius Sulpicius Quirinius, or if you read some of the Greek texts, um, it's uh, Cyrenius. He was a well-known Roman official who lived from about 51 BC to 21 AD, and he's actually mentioned by a whole bunch of different authors, uh, Josephus, Suetonius, Pliny the Elder, Cassius Deo, Tacitus, Strabo, Caesar Augustus himself, and Luke. I mean, that's eight different ancient authors that, that write about Quirinius. So we know quite a lot about him. In fact, on my blog, BibleArchaeologyReport.com, I went through, and uh, in my bioarchaeography of Quirinius, I've, I've put an appendix there where I include every single known inscription or reference to him in these ancient writings. And so we know a lot about him. Josephus, for example, describes him as a man of great dignity. Suetonius says he was extremely rich. Um, we know from other writings that he um, held a variety of roles in the Roman Empire. He was a senator, a consul, a legate. Um, we have an inscription um, that names P. Sulpicius Quirinius the Dumvir. And, and a Dumvir was a, a two-man magistrate team in the Roman Empire. And so we know that he held all kinds of roles. And it appears that he rose to fame as a military commander when he conquered a group of Pisidian uh, tribes and, um, and during the reign of Caesar Augustus. That's where he rose to fame. And uh, he was married twice. We know this from the writings, first to Appia Claudia and later to uh, Amelia Lepida, both of whom he divorced. And the latter one was a really messy affair. Um, he accused her of trying to poison him, of adultery, of astrology, of claiming that, that she had a son by him. And he said, no, she didn't. And in fact, he prosecuted her mercilessly um, and had her exiled. Perhaps the most succinct biography of Quirinius comes from Tacitus. He tells us that, Quir that Tiberius Caesar made a request to the Senate to honor Quirinius's death in 21 AD with a public funeral. And he describes him as a great soldier who was zealous. Um, and, and Caesar Augustus thought highly of him. He, he talks about extolling his good offices, although Tacitus does mention that the people generally didn't think very much of Quirinius. He says they generally had no pleasure in the memory of Quirinius because of the perils he had brought on Lepida. That was his, his um, second wife who he divorced, and because of the meanness and dangerous of his power at the last. And so that is who Quirinius was. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. You know, a, a lot of these government or historical figures, sometimes we'll have inscriptions that mention them and sort of government functions that they were in. But here we have the poor guy's dirty laundry hanging out 2,000 years later. Uh, <laughs> it's quite extraordinary that that was recorded for posterity. So let's, let's uh, so we, we've established Quirinius. Luke is in that context. Um, but, you know, the problem becomes a bit thorny as we try to relate it to the census. So let's start exploring that a little bit, Brian. 
Well, let's start with what Scripture says. Uh, it says in Luke 2, 1 to 3, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. And you're right, Henry. Um, Luke's mention of Quirinius in connection with the census uh, and his role in Syria at the time have caused no shortage of difficulty for those who hold to the historical reliability of Scripture. Some critics have declared that there was no Roman census around that time, and we explored that in our last episode on um, on Caesar Augustus. And people have said, well, no, um, there, there's uh, there's no evidence uh, of that at the time. Of course, remember we said that's a that's a um, an, an argument from silence. And so others have pointed out that no, 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 Quirinius was governor of Syria in six A.D. We know that from history, um, and and he oversaw a census at that time. Luke just got all confused with things. For example, in his book, The History of the Jewish People in the Time of Christ, Emil Schur concludes. There's no alternative but to recognize that the evangelist based his statement on uncertain historical information. Is that true? Is there no alternative? I don't think it is true. In fact, I think that there are some good, plausible explanations to show how and why Luke can be entirely accurate in his description of Quirinius and the census. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, as we emphasized in that previous episode, we'll re-emphasize here, Brian, the, the, the way that when a person is looking at the Bible with a skeptical eye, wherever they find a gap or information that's lacking externally, it's always a negative conclusion, it seems, or it's, it's most often, instead of the Bible given uh, sort of the, um, uh, the, the benefit of the doubt, if you will. I got about a minute left. Maybe you could comment on that a little bit about our experience with that before we go to a break. Well, you're right, Henry. And, and I think if, if anything um, we've learned from archaeology, we need to be careful with that because there have been so many times when people have looked at something in the Bible and said, well, hang on, we don't have evidence for that. The Bible must be wrong. And then all of a sudden, a discovery comes along that shows that the Bible was right after all. And I think Luke has shown himself to be over and over again a highly reliable historian. He claims he did all sorts of careful research, that he interviewed eyewitnesses, um, and that what he writes in other places has been shown completely accurate. In this case, there's some discrepancy. I think we need to give him the benefit of the doubt here, especially in light of the fact that there are some plausible explanations. Yeah, that's really good. I think the lesson for the Christian, too, who's trying to faithfully obey the Word of God and follow Jesus, is that if the external answers aren't forthcoming, trust the Word of God and wait and see what happens. And oftentimes what we find is that the evidence shows itself over a period of time. And that's a good word to end this segment with. Uh, friends, we'll be right back after a brief message. We're here talking with Brian Wendell about the census in Luke 2. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures for students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Brian Wendell, and we're talking about Luke chapter 2 and the census that took place while Quirinius was governing in Syria. Now, Brian, some of the ways that scholars have tried to explain uh, Luke's comments, they're kind of variegated. There's a number of them. Maybe you could give the audience uh, sort of a survey of some of the ideas that are kicked around out there. Sure. Well, there have been a number of ways that scholars, particularly Christian scholars, who uh, believe that what Luke write, wrote is accurate, have tried to explain it. Um, one is to suggest that it was Josephus who was wrong, not Luke. 
much of what we know about the chronology around the time of the birth of Christ comes from Josephus. And so some people have suggested, no, Luke didn't get it wrong, Josephus did. Others have, have said, well, that word first, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor uh, of Syria, can be translated before. And so maybe we should retranslate that verse to be, this was the census that took place before Quirinius was governor of Syria, because we know he was governor in 6 AD. But this would be very awkward, a very highly unlikely reading of the Greek. Others have said, well, actually, um, it might be that he was governor twice. We know he was governor at 6 AD. Maybe he was governor at a time prior to that. In fact, um, we have archaeological evidence that this was possible. There was a tombstone that was discovered near Trivoli, and in, in it, it says that the person whose tomb this was, was twice legate of Augustus in Syria. And there are some scholars who believe that this is the tombstone of Quirinius. Unfortunately, it's fragmented. We don't actually have the name of the person um, who was buried there. And so um, identifying it as Quirinius is, is speculative. But what we can conclude is that it was possible for someone to serve as legate in an area twice, and someone did twice in Syria. Another um, theory proposes there were maybe two legates of Syria at the same time, Quirinius being one of them. And while some of these proposals have more validity than others, I take a different approach when I come to this problem. Rather than looking at particular theories uh, and specific solutions, I take a step back and I analyze it from a general perspective. When, when we look at what history um, we know from history and what we don't know from history. And when we look at what scripture says and what it doesn't say, and we kind of take a, a step back and look at it, I believe that what we find is that Luke's comments about Quirinius are consistent with the type of roles that he held in the Roman Empire um, as an official of Caesar, including taking a census. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, like, I like that you're kind of zooming the camera lens out a little bit because it's good to get into the forest, but you also, you need to do both when you're studying the Bible and you're comparing it to the external evidence. And certainly, at the very least, Luke is being consistent. His knowledge of Quirinius and his role in the ancient world is intimate knowledge he has of it. So that's at the very least what we can we glean out of that. Um, so what, what else does, does the text of Scripture give us, Brian? You mentioned what Scripture says and what it does not say. And that's a very important principle, actually, for Bible study, for certainly what we do in apologetics. We don't want to defend something that the Bible actually doesn't claim. Uh, that's another important idea. But go ahead and expand on that, if you would, a little bit. Well, let's take a look at those two things. First of all, what, what we know from history, what we don't know from history. Um, in his book, um, Was Christ Born at Bethlehem, Sir William Ramsey noted, the only certain dates in the life of Quirinius are his consulship in 12 BC, his second government in Syria beginning in 6 AD, his prosecution of his former wife in 20 AD, and his death in 21. And in, in the hundred years since he wrote those words, um, we have not had any major discoveries that would give us um, positive, definitive dates in the life of Quirinius. The reality is that between 12 BC and 6 AD, we don't know much about what he was doing. Um, and so there's a lot about what was happening around the time of Christ that we don't know. And then we, we use the same approach to Scripture. What do we know? What don't we know? What does it say? What does it not say? The first thing to note is that Luke does not say that Quirinius was the governor of Syria, the, the legate of Syria. It says, despite the way it's translated it in our English Bibles, it actually, the, the Greek says that he was governing, a more general term. Um, and given the number of different roles that Quirinius held, um, all of those could be counted under that title of governing. And now, so we know that he was governing in Syria at 6 AD. That's when Herod Archelaus was deposed. Um, Josephus tells us that Quirinius was sent into Judea, um, which was now a, a province of Syria, to take account of the substance and to dispose of Archelaus' money. But the Jews, he says, um, took the report of taxation uh, heinously and, and were very opposed to it at the time. Um, and his position as uh, in this role, 
we know this from history because there was a, the discovery of a tombstone in Beirut. It's known as the Emilius Secundus inscription, and in it, uh, Emilius Secundus uh, mentions Quirinius. He mentions him as the legate of Caesar in Syria, and he mentions um, that he was asked, uh, tasked with carrying out this census of Quirinius at, at 6 AD. And so we know that from history. In fact, Luke knows that too, because he mentions that in Acts 5.37, that there was a census and a tax revolt at the time. So we know that. The second thing really quickly to note is that the text does not say it was a tax census. That's an unfortunate mistranslation from the King James Version. It actually is just a general word meaning registration or census. And we, again, know this to be true from history. Yeah, that's, that's really good. You know, again, we go back to the idea, the, the bigger picture you're giving here. Luke is in, obviously intimately familiar with the second one as well, the second census, Acts chapter 5. Um, we also know that it doesn't say it was a tax. Now, maybe it was or maybe it wasn't, but this text of Scripture does not specify that. So that's a very important consideration. This is why translation from the original language is so important, you know, continuing to make it more accurate for the audience. Well, that's a very good summary, Brian. Thank you for doing that. And so, friends, uh, we're going to move uh, to a break right now. Uh, in a few moments, we'll return for our next segment talking about Quirinius governing in Syria at the time of the birth of Jesus and the census that took place. And we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here today with Brian Wendell. We're talking about the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, uh, the census that took place, Quirinius, who was governing in Syria at, during the time of Caesar Augustus. Very specific historical circumstances that the author, Luke, places these momentous events of redemptive history. So, Brian, uh, you gave a kind of a survey of some things, big picture, uh, being careful about what Scripture says, what it doesn't say, what we know from history, what we don't know from history, and just being very careful about how we treat the evidence. Let's pick that up. What are some proposed ways that we might reconcile uh, the data that we do know? Uh, perhaps you could give a survey of that. Well, and this is the point where we have to put this all together, right? We have to look at what we do know from Scripture, what Scripture says. We have to look at what we do know from history, what history says, and, and what are some ways that we can put this together. Quirinius may very well have been governing in some capacity in Syria, Syria around the time of Christ's birth and conducted an earlier registration. Remember, we said he conducted a registration at in 6 AD, a census, a tax census. Nobody debates that particular one. The question is, did he conduct a previous one? Was he governing in Syria around the time of Christ's birth, anywhere between 6 and 2 BC, which is the date most people give for the birth of Christ? Well, some, here's one, one solution. Some have suggested that he was legate of Syria twice. He was legate of Syria in 6 AD. He was also the legate, the governor of Syria um, back at the time of Christ's birth. And we know that this is true. In the previous segment, we showed the, the tombstone uh, from Trivoli that mentioned someone was twice legate in Syria. Very possible, plausible explanation. In fact, scholars Holden and Giesler conclude the probability that Quirinius was governor of Syria on two different occasions cannot be ignored. Once, while he was doing the military action um, that he rose to fame with uh, between 12 and 2 BC, and then another time sometime around 680. So that's one solution. Uh, another 
solution is that even if he wasn't the legate of Syria, that's not what Luke says. Luke says he was governing in Syria at that time, and he may have held a different role that was considered governing. Again, we have so much writing about Quirinius. We know that he held so many different roles in the Roman Empire. Jared Compton summarizes, he says, Quirinius's personal chronology is not fully known, particularly around the years of Jesus' birth. Thus, it's not impossible that he held another office at the time, which Luke appropriately describes as governing in Syria, and that it was in that office that he oversaw a census. Yeah, you, you know, that, that's really good. That's, a good. that's a good summary. You mentioned earlier in a previous segment, too, there is this gap of knowledge in the chronology of his life. The other thing, as far as the office goes, you know, if I could use a, 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 an American example, Grover Cleveland ran for president, won. Then he ran for, uh, ran for a second time, lost. Then he ran four years later and was president again. He was president twice, but there was a, a period in between where he was not president. So that would be a, a modern analogy. Uh, it would be common uh, in a government office. So seriously, not unprecedented uh, in the ancient world, as you showed before, and even in the modern day, this kind of thing could happen. So, um, so let's just explore it a little bit further. I guess the question would be, uh, we know from the Acts 5 reference, and this reminds me too, Brian, sorry, I make a, just make a point. Luke is in that context. He's got the 6th uh, AD census in Acts 5, even though Luke is living 40, 50, 60 years later. So he's got that right. Why would we think that he mumbled up the first one uh, in the time of Jesus? You know, that's a thought that I've, I've had about that. It just, it doesn't make sense. No, and, and especially when we look back, and, and we looked at this in our episode on Caesar Augustus, we know that there are two events that happened around the time of Christ's birth, which two censuses or registrations that might be what Luke was referring to. Um, the first, of course, Caesar himself describes a census that he took in 8 BC. If Jesus was born in 6 BC, as some scholars believe, um, and, and a census would have taken years to, uh, to do. I mean, the, the census that David took in 2 Samuel took nine months to complete, and that was only a small geographic uh, area when he did that. And so the entire Roman er, uh, Empire would have taken years. That might be the one. But there, there's another event, uh, an event that took place in, in around 2 BC, um, where um, the Senate gave Caesar the title Father of the People and 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 Josephus describes how people came and 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 swore an oath of, of loyalty to Caesar, and he notes that 6,000 Pharisees refused to do that. Well, how would he know that there was that number? Well, scholars have theorized there might have been a registration in that particular time, and an ancient historian, Erosius, um, likely referred to this registration when he wrote that the census of Luke was the one in which all the great nations came and took an oath of loyalty to Caesar and were made part of one society. So, so you're right, Henry. I mean, there are events that, that we know from history around the time of Christ's birth. Luke got, got it right with the 6 AD census, and we know of other ones earlier. I suggest that, that he was accurately recording one of those. Yeah, th that's a great summary. Now, Brian, uh, believe it or not, you've got about a little bit over a minute left to sum up the episode. And uh, I know that's a tall task, but I'm going to give it to you because I know how well of a job you're going to do. So go for it. You got a minute. Well, um, when we step back, and this is the approach that I like to take with Quirinius, we step back and look at his life kind of from a big picture. What we see about Quirinius in this one little mention in Scripture, that he was um, governing in Syria, that it was the census that took place when uh, Quirinius was first governing in Syria, just one little mention in Scripture. And yet we have so much writing from outside of the Bible that describes Quirinius's life that when we compare the two, what we see is that they do indeed line up, um, that, it's, that it's accurate. Um, Luke claims to have carefully investigated everything. We see this in his book of Luke. We see this in the book of Acts. We have seen times where Luke has been accused of, of being inaccurate. Oh, no, 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 we don't know of anything about um, that particular um, type of uh, 
well, for example, I think it's Polytarchs in, in Thessalonica, and then all of a sudden later we find inscriptions, yes, he actually was using an accurate term at the time. There's been so much of that that Luke has demonstrated himself to be reliable at that I would suggest that in this case, he got it right because it lines up with what we know from history, generally. It lines up with what we know about Quirinius generally as well. And I would just say this, if it is true, if what he wrote is historically accurate, then this is great news because it means that the Savior of the world came. He was announced with angel choruses. He was born during the reign of Caesar Augustus when Quirinius uh, took this census. And, and Luke goes on to tell us that he, Jesus came, he lived, and he died for our sins, and he rose again. This is great news of great joy for all people this Christmas. Brian, that's an excellent way to end the show. Thank you for being with us. And friends, we wish you a very Merry Christmas as you celebrate the birth of our Savior. 